Today's strange but true stories start off with a story of one of the weirdest official causes of death that a medical examiner can give. Then we look at the heroic yet tragic story of an 11-year-old girl who went on a sailing trip with her family. She didn't know that this was going to turn out to be her worst nightmare. And finally, we'll check out the Euthanasia Roller Coaster, a ride designed to kill you. Michael Faraday, who was a 76-year-old Irishman, died in a fire in December 2010. The coroner in charge of his autopsy, Dr. Sirian McLaughlin, said that he could not find any evidence to explain Faraday's death except for spontaneous combustion, which is a questionable explanation given when a human body is burned without evidence of any external source of ignition. And as you can imagine, this goes beyond our understanding of science and how things work, making this official report quite strange. Faraday was found lying on his back on his living room floor. The living room didn't have any signs of damage except for the ceiling that was directly above Faraday and for the floor directly below him. And this is characteristic of spontaneous combustion, where there is little to no damage anywhere except in the very localized spot where the fire occurred. Regarding Faraday's death, Dr. McLaughlin said, The fire was thoroughly investigated and I'm left with a conclusion that this fits into the category of spontaneous human combustion for which there is no adequate explanation. That report does not sit well with everybody though. Mike Green, who is a retired professor of pathology, has spoken out against spontaneous combustion, saying that he has seen this scenario time and time again. He explains that the reason for not finding any ignition source in these cases is simply that the fire destroyed it. He said that without question, there is an ignition source somewhere. So what do you think about this? Is spontaneous combustion real? It was November 1961 when a Green Bay optometrist named Arthur Duperault chartered a 60-foot sailboat named the Bluebell to sail from Florida to the Bahamas. This was a vacation that he had dreamt of for years and he was excited to bring his wife, Jean, along with her three kids, Brian, who was 14, Terry Joe, who was 11, and Renee, who was 7. Arthur also hired a man named Julian Harvey, who was a Marine and a World War II veteran, and he was there to help navigate the journey. Harvey then brought his wife, Mary Dean. They set sail, and for the first several days, the trip was terrific. Everyone was enjoying snorkeling in the clear tropical waters near the small islands they passed, and the boat's deck was a cozy place to lounge in the sun and listen to the ocean's waves. The night of November 12th started out like any other night, and when it was time, Arthur and Jean sent Terry Joe and Renee to settle in for bed. It didn't take long for Terry Joe to drift off to sleep listening to the waves splashing against the ship. Then, she was snapped out of a deep sleep by someone screaming for help. She realized it was her brother's voice, and then the screaming stopped, and the ship fell silent. She sat up in her bed for several minutes, and after not hearing anything for all of that time, she found the courage to get up and make her way to her cabin's door. She cautiously opened it, making her way to the main cabin. Inside, she found her mother and brother lying in bloody pools on the floor, and it was clear that they were dead. She moved around the main cabin, doing her best not to step in any of the sticky blood that seemed to be everywhere. Then she climbed up the stairs to the deck, and it was dark, but the moonlight lit it, revealing more blood. Terry Joe looked up in time to see Julian Harvey running at her. He hit her, and then he pushed her down the stairs as he yelled for her to get back down there. Terry Joe lay at the bottom of the stairs for a moment, then she got up, luckily without any injuries, and she made her way back to her small cabin. She sat on her bed and she stared at the wall as shock set in. Several minutes later, she saw Harvey's silhouette standing in her doorway. It looked like he had a shotgun in his hand. He stood there motionless and silent, and then turned around and went back up to the deck. Shortly after that, Terry Joe watched water flood into her cabin, and in no time it was up to her mattress, and she knew that she had no choice but to go back up to the deck or stay down there and drowned. When she reached the deck, she saw Harvey and she screamed to him, asking him if the ship was sinking. He said yes and then he handed her a rope and he told her to hold on to it, but she was unable to grab that rope and it slipped over the side of the ship. Harvey then cried out that the dinghy was gone and he jumped overboard. Terry was alone and in the middle of the ocean on a sinking ship and surrounded by her dead family. But somehow she recalled that there was a lifeboat hanging on the side of the deck. It was small, only five foot long and two and a half feet wide, but it was better than nothing. She fought her way over to the boat, sloshing through the water that was covering the deck. She was mentally able to pull it together enough to untie the four half-hitched knots that held the lifeboat to the ship. 
She pushed that boat off the sinking ship and got in. And for the next four days, Terry Joe was stranded in the middle of the ocean. There was no sign of Harvey, and it didn't take long for the Bluebell to be completely submerged in the ocean. The nights were freezing, and the days were brutal with the sun shining down, burning Terry Joe's skin. She didn't have any food or water, and she just laid on that float waiting to die. Meanwhile, Harvey had been picked up by a ship called the Gulf Lion. The crew brought him on board and asked him what happened and why he had a dead girl in the raft that was attached to his dinghy. Harvey began telling his lies, explaining that a squall hit the ship, causing enough damage to rupture the gas lines in the engine room. Soon, the ship was going up in flames and slowly sinking. He said that when the masts in the rigging collapsed, they landed on the cockpit where the Duperault family was gathered, trapping them there. So Harvey jumped overboard after launching the ship's dinghy and life raft. And he said that he then saw Renee floating face down with her life jacket on, so he pulled her onto the raft. Harvey was flown to Miami, where the Coast Guard contacted him and asked him to appear for questioning about the sinking of the ship and the deaths of the passengers. On November 16th, Harvey appeared in front of the investigators and told his story again. While Harvey was being interrogated in Miami, a person on the Greek freighter called Captain Theo spotted someone out in the middle of the ocean, and though he couldn't make out what it was, it concerned him enough so that he went and told his captain about it. And the captain steered the ship towards that object and soon they were looking at a young girl waving at his ship. The crew brought Terry Joe on board. She had a terrible sunburn, she was dehydrated, and she was extremely weak. She couldn't even stand up on her own and she was barely able to speak, although she was able to tell the captain her name. The Coast Guard came and assisted with bringing Terry Joe back to the United States, where she was admitted to Miami's Mercy Hospital. And once her doctor felt that she was well enough, he let investigators speak with her. Back in Miami, Harvey's interrogation was interrupted by someone bursting into the room saying that another survivor named Terry Joe had been found. Harvey stood up and he walked out of the room without saying a word and he went back to his apartment. He was later found there with a self-inflicted wound that ended his life. The theory is that he killed his wife to get a $20,000 insurance payout and then killed the Duperall family to ensure there were no witnesses. He recovered Renee's body so that he could better sell his story when he was rescued. Terry Joe went on to live a fulfilling life and has three children. Usually, when you sit down on a roller coaster, you expect to continue your day when the ride's over. But Lithuanian artist and designer Hulihonis Urbonis realized that with the right design, you could ensure that a willing passenger would never leave the ride alive. He calls his design the Euthanasia Roller Coaster. And as you may know, euthanasia is the practice of intentionally ending a terminally ill person's life to relieve their suffering. His hypothetical design is a 24,751 foot long roller coaster that takes 3 minutes and 20 seconds from start to finish. Its 1,600 foot drop and 7 loops are designed to cause the passenger to experience a g-force of 10 for 1 minute. And g-force describes the force felt when someone speeds up quickly. It's the sensation of being pressed back in your seat when you're accelerating in a car, or in this case, a roller coaster. 1G is the normal gravitational force on Earth's surface. Once the passenger has said goodbye to their friends and their family who have gathered at the coaster with them, the rider sits down in a roller coaster cart for one. A health monitoring system is connected to their body, and then they are strapped into their seat. They then slowly ascend the 1,600-foot incline, and that takes several minutes, and it's been specifically designed that way to allow the passenger time to change their mind. Once the passenger is at the top of the incline, They'll press a button that initiates the coaster's fall, giving them complete control over the life-ending ride. Once that fall button is pressed, gravity takes over and the car races down the track at 220 miles an hour. And for reference, the fastest roller coaster in the world reaches a maximum speed of 149 miles an hour. The cart then races into the first loop, which results in a force of G10 on the passenger. And this intense pressure forces the air out of the lungs and it pushes blood out of the brain leaving it starved of oxygen and vital nutrients. By the end of the second loop, the passenger will have lost consciousness. The remaining five loops keep that G10 pressure on the body and ensures death as the brain dies. When the ride is over, the passenger's health monitor is checked, and if all went as planned, it'll show that the patient is no longer alive. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think about these stories in the comments. I'm sure that you have some thoughts on that euthanasia roller coaster.